Welcome to Journal Club. I'm Steve Hill from Lifespan.io. I bet you were expecting uh, Oliver uh, this week, but uh, sorry, you're going to have to put up with me today as uh, Oliver is uh, unfortunately detained. So sorry about that, folks. However, just to make up, we do have a, a special guest today with us. We've got Dr. Irina Conboy and uh, Dr. Michael Conboy. And many of you in the audience watching may know that um, they're very well known for um, their experiments with uh, blood factors in aged and uh, aged blood. And there's been quite a considerable interest in that in the last few years, trying to find the secret source in young blood to make people young and vice versa. However, our guests today hold the, uh, the position that everything we need or certainly rejuvenation factors are already in old blood. So they've been busy trying to uh, push that forward. And we're going to talk about their latest paper today, which personally I'm very excited about. I'll try and contain myself, but I'm very excited about it. So uh, welcome, Irina and Michael. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Steve. And uh, we've got quite a lot of people already watching. So that will be, uh, should, should have some questions. Just a reminder, everybody watching on Facebook as well, as always, if you do have any questions or your comments um, that, that you'd like to put to, uh, put, put to the, uh, the chat here, just go ahead and type in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll get that relayed. So, uh, so I suppose without further ado, I will uh, hand things over to Irina and, and, uh, and Michael and they can, they can tell us all about the exciting things they've been up to. All right, you guys see my screen? Yeah? Oh, so, um, so this is um, a follow up paper on the one that we published, I think in May, 2020. So this work was published in November and it extends the um, phenotypes of tissue rejuvenation from muscle, liver, and brain to animal cognition and reversal of senescence and also attenuation of neuroinflammation. So broadly speaking, everything that was previously tested with young blood seems to not need young blood, in fact, clearly resoundingly does not need young blood for rejuvenation and dilution of age elevated proteins in all blood serum is sufficient. So what you see in A is the experimental method that we used where we have an old animal, old mouse here, and it is exchanged with a tube of saline supplemented with albumin. MSA stands for mouse serum albumin. And albumin is just a carrier protein that is abundantly present in young blood and in old blood. So we provide it not as the young factor, but simply because we throw out mouse's own albumin when we perform the procedure. So during this procedure with our device, blood exchange small circuitry extracorporeal device, we, we then replace about 50% of all blood with saline and replenish albumin. And as control for the procedure, because there are multiple steps involved, we use young to young blood exchange and old to old blood exchange, where young mice are exchanged with young blood from another mouse and old mice are exchanged with old blood from another mouse. So this controls for all of the steps of the procedure itself. And then um, in our typical protocol, we then have a time frame when we look at the particular parameters of tissue health and performance known as hallmarks of aging. And to give you a heads up, we, we look at numerous parameters, including proteomics and epigenetics, transcriptomics, tissue histology, how tissue repairs, many, many things. But in the most recently published paper that I'm discussing here, we specifically look at, let me adjust here, yeah. We specifically look at um, cognition and neuroinflammation. And the reason being is that 
infusions of young blood into old animals were shown to improve those parameters, as well as parabiosis, where two animals are sutured with each other. But interestingly, blood exchange, where animals are not physically joined, but just blood is exchanged, did not seem to improve these parameters, animal cognition. And additionally, the work on infusing old mammals with somebody else's bodily fluids from young mammals seemed not to have much uh, continuation in recent years. So we thought to expand our paradigm of aging and rejuvenation due to age elevated systemic factors to cognition here. And also um, while I'm speaking, I'm going to uh, check chat if I can, maybe not. Um, but uh, if you have any questions while I'm speaking, then I don't know what the protocol is here. Please put them in chat and perhaps Steve then can uh, select some questions for me to answer. Or um, this is not a very big paper, so you can even interrupt me and ask questions. Yeah, just to let you know, Irina, we've got about 50 people uh, watching from Facebook at the moment. So and that usually okay. goes. So. Thank you for, um, for watching. So, um, so first I will describe the tests that we perform and the tests uh, then measure animal cognition. And on the in C, you see the um, novel texture recognition and in D, novel object recognition. And in this test, we are asking animals, young and old, to discriminate between, distinguish between old texture and the new texture and old object and the new object. And as you probably know, younger mammals, animals and people, then pay attention to new things and old animals or people do not. So they have less inquisitiveness. And so then the same happens in this base setup analysis. If you compare the performance of young mice, control young mice exchange with young blood, then they pay attention to new textures, they recognize them, they remember what was old and what is new, and they go and investigate them as compared to old animals that do not. And after single dilution of age elevated systemic milieu, which we call neutral blood exchange or NBE, old animals now are cognitively indistinguishable from the young. And I will come back to this point, why it is important that they are not simply improved, but they become young-like. And then the same conclusion then is um, provided by the data from the novel object recognition test that young animals know which one is old, which one is new, and they investigate and study the new one, so they spend more time there. And old animals do not really care or they do not remember. And then single exchange of old animals, the saline supplemented with albumin makes them young-like. And this work is a collaboration with Professor Yuzu Laboratory, UC Santa Cruz. And um, uh, now we have these assays going in our lab as well and a very interesting and in progress study. So moving on from that, uh, then the next question is, how can we explain that cognition became better? And uh, previously we published that this procedure neutral blood exchange improves hippocampal neurogenesis. And I will show you some figures on that as well in current presentation. And hippocampal neurogenesis is really formation of new neurons in this area of the hippocampus known as subgranular zone of the NPGRs. Hippocampus is responsible for memory and learning. So it would be logical to assume that the reason that the mice became cognitively better is because now more neurons were formed. However, it is not feasible because there is no time for these neurons to integrate into the rest of the brain and the cerebral cortex and then make mice smarter because we study what they do just at one week after the blood exchange. So then our alternative hypothesis was focused on the reduction of neuroinflammation. 
And so what you see in these colorful depictions are various regions in the brain where we found microglia being activated, and that is a reflection of neuroinflammation, to different degrees in young and old mice. So microglia is not really a glia, it is not neuronal cell type, it is really myeloid macrophage-like cell type in the brain, and they take care of clearing the brain from extracellular junk, as well as um, any kind of pathogen or antigen in the brain itself. So they perform the role of macrophages in the brain. And the aging inflammation rises everywhere, including in the brain, as shown here. For example, comparing young, young control animals with old, old, all of these red dots reflect microglia, which is activated and is expressing CD68 markers. And then after a single procedure of neutral blood exchange, neuroinflammation significantly diminishes. Once again, making this parameter similar to the control young animals and very different from the typical old animals. And so that fits with the improved cognition because you can imagine that if you have neuroinflammation in the brain and you have a headache, you probably then will not remember what is the new object or new texture and have no desire to go and explore them. So in our opinion, improved cognition that is improved very rapidly is linked to quickly diminished neuroinflammation and therefore improved environment of existing neurons. And in collaboration with Professor Yizu, we plan to study this in more detail. So then there is additional um, studies that we did. And particularly, we were interested to see um, what happens with brain senescence when we perform procedure of neutral blood exchange. Because um, basically the procedure itself affects only peripheral milieu of the mouse. So we really exchange the circulation. However, uh, we saw improved response essentially in the brain, suggesting that there is a communication as many people proposed for the past 30 years or so, between peripheral molecules such as proteins in the blood and brain. And so what we saw when we compared neutral blood exchange with known senolytic ABT263, which inhibits BCL family members, is that in both cases, even though the molecules or processes are applied peripherally, we see reduction of senescent cells in the brain. So this is control for senolytic old vehicle or controlled for neutral blood exchange, old, old exchange. And you see that there are numerous senescent cells in brain parenchyma. And then either ABT applied peripherally or neutral blood exchange significantly reduce the presence of senescence in the brain which is quantified in this colorful diagram here. And the assay is the typical senescence associated beta gal assay. So that was interesting. It suggested that peripheral SARS or other inflammatory cytokines propagate senescence to the brain, which is quite an interesting idea because not just neutral blood exchange, but non-senolytic was able to reduce those. Oh, and it was published in numerous papers that ABT does not cross blood-brain barrier, so it had to act in the periphery, not centrally in the brain. And so that brings me to the uh, studies on neurogenesis, which are quite interesting and perhaps surprising. So since we already published that neutral blood exchange significantly improves neurogenesis, and both neutral blood exchange and ABT reduce central senescence, we wanted to see if ABT senolytic also improves neurogenesis, which would be quite interesting and potentially clinically applicable. You know, it is an easier way to control 
tissue rejuvenation by a molecule than by process. But what we found is that no, ABT does not improve neurogenesis at all. So here is kind of repetitive looking images of the hippocampal area where new neurons are born throughout our adult life, looking like V, and those are called dentigeres, and typical neurons are formed in this subgranular zone at the inner edge. And they are depicted by proliferation marker Ki67, and what you clearly see here is that there are no such cells. And in contrast, we see such cells in young animals. And then you can quantify all kinds of different experimental um, setup where you can have old animals that have injury or no injury. This is uninjured animals versus injured animals and they are treated with synalytic IBT or vehicle control. And under no circumstances, there is an improvement in neurogenesis which is in contrast to what we have published with respect to the neutral blood exchange where neurogenesis is rejuvenated. So even though senescent cells are reduced by synalytic and by neutral blood exchange, and both of these work peripherally and not directly in the brain, only neutral blood exchange improves neurogenesis. And kind of the same idea is true about neuroinflammation. So here again, images of the uh, brain sections where activated microglia is CD68 positive, shown in the red dots here. And there are numerous of these activated microglia areas as compared to our control for immunofluorescence, which we always use. Rabbit IgG is a negative control. And it is clear that there is significant neuroinflammation in our brain, which has been known. So this is the internal confirmation of our data. But ABT synalytic does not reduce this neuroinflammation in contrast to neutral blood exchange or dilution of systemic age-elevated proteins. However, synalytic had um, a small distinctive effect on reducing how much of CD68 is present on the cells. So when we compare the size of the CD68 clusters or whether these dots were very big, right? We can measure the pixel density of the dots or they were smaller, even though the numbers of the dots did not change, but the size of the dots did. So it looks like particularly for the injured animals, they were injured in their skeletal muscle, Synalytic ABT reduced the magnitude of inflammation, even though the numbers of activated microglia cells were the same. So there is a small but potentially interesting effect. And so then we decided to proceed with mouse to human conservation studies and also looking at the protein. And there we um, analyzed the blood proteomics for the proteins which are known to regulate brain health or function. And I think I will try to show you the table first. And then, yeah. Um, and we compared proteins simultaneously modulated. So all of these proteins listed will, were modulated simultaneously with each other. And they're modulated by NB, neutral blood exchange procedure in mice, or therapeutic plasma exchange procedure in people. So because we saw improvement in cognition and reduction of neuroinflammation, we wanted then to analyze the data from this perspective. Does it make sense molecularly? If you look at all of the changes in the blood, can you explain why brain became younger and healthier? And indeed, we identified several numerous proteins such as BDNF, tomoregulin, uh, MMPs, GROA, HBEGF, angiogenin, and, and so forth, and they are all published and listed. And each of these proteins has an important function in the brain. For example, neurogenesis, neuroprotection, neuroplasticity to learning and memory, uh, also attenuation of the um, amyloid beta, which causes Alzheimer's disease for particular um, peptides of, of that species. 
um, and basically a lot of neuroprotection and function. And similarly, there was evolutionary conservation between the effects of dilution of all systemic milieu between people and mice. There was a lot of neuroprotection activity that was upregulated in bloodstream. So our hypothesis is that those proteins are elevated because they were suppressed by age increase of other systemic proteins. Once we normalize those proteins back to young levels, then all of this neuroprotective and uh, um, positive for brain function proteome was naturally restored. And you might think about, well, can we just add BDNF and then make old animal brain younger and such approaches were used, but Unfortunately, BDNF alone will not be able to offset all of the multiple age-related changes. And here we can figure out how many and at what concentrations and combinations of the proteins were naturally elevated. They could be considered to be young protein, although they are present, of course, in young and old and even embryonic mammals. But what is key about them that they are diminished with age and we don't have to add them back one by one, particularly we don't know which ones to add that and what levels, they are restored when the age elevated proteome is diminished and normalized. And uh, to give you then an idea of our computational biology projects, I will switch to this last figure and to have excellent computational biology team. In our laboratory, students um, have dual majors, typically in bioengineering and computer science, and so they like doing this um, analysis process, which is great. And so you can see how both for the mouse system, neutral blood exchange, and human system of therapeutic plasma exchange, there is a clear difference between the proteome before versus after the procedure. So there is a clear difference in clustering of these proteins and they are also delineated here in the heat map below with respect to their identity. So let's see, I guess, yeah, for human and for mouse. So I guess this is the, um, the data description of that follow-up paper that, um, that we published more recently. And to take home, the take home messages are um, in our discussion are, kind of strengthening the original discovery that it turns out very interestingly that young blood is not the driver of aging or, or rejuvenation, but instead elevation or age imposed elevation of specific proteins in bloodstream account for those paradigms. So we do not age because we run out of things. We run out of things because other proteins become excessive and inhibit them. They do not disappear from our genome. And if blood proteome is calibrated and normalized, then they are restored naturally and physiologically. So I will stop here and see if there are any questions. Oh yes, we've got quite a few actually. There's quite a, a few from uh, Facebook. So let's just see. Although my scroll button stopped working for some reason. Okay. Mikolaj, uh, Mikolaj. Sorry about that. It sounds like Polish. It sounds Polish. So apologies for my awful pronunciation. Uh, but he asks, would it make sense to perform this procedure after senolytic treatment to clear the lingering SASP in the blood? Um, so I don't think that this procedure would synergize with clearing SASP cells. And the key point here is that there is no protein that evolved to make us old or sick. So SASP proteins are all very, very important for our health when they are present at the young levels. So synolytics or synostatics, as I see from Victor's question there, um, are focused on reversing what putative senescent cells do in vivo. But regardless of what they do, 
if the systemic milieu which connects one tissue to another and one organ to another is normalized to its younger levels, then there should be a positive effect not only on multiple tissue, tissues, but also on senescent cells. So I don't know to what degree senescent cells exist in vivo and what other else they are still debating that concept. But if they exist, they should become less senescent from the neutral blood exchange or therapeutic plasma exchange procedures. Right, and I see, um, I see Oliver's here. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I'm about uh, what is it? Uh, Ten minutes late uh, to the meeting. Um, <laughs> Ten my, minutes. My yeah, twelve thirty, right? Um, my well, twelve, Oliver. Twelve. Oh my God. Um, Oops. <laughs> well, my laptop, my laptop gave up the ghost. It's crashed, so I'm having to patch in using my my cell, my my phone here. So sorry about that. That's all right. We'll uh, we'll leave it for the heroes to decide if Oliver's going to be in detention for the rest of the week. But uh, yeah, good to see you anyway. We Thanks. did wonder where you were. We thought something awful had happened, and it sounds like your laptop's bricked. Oops. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's currently still trying to re-download Zoom, and everything just crashed. I'm not sure why. But anyway, oh, sorry about that, guys. Well, you've joined us at a good time because it's question time now, and we've got quite a few coming in, and I'm sure oh. you might have some yourself too. I do. Um, here's one we get asked quite a lot, Arena, and it's obviously a bit silly, and I think they thought it was a bit silly because they put a smiley face. But Dan, um, Dan Mi Mihai, sorry about the pronunciation again. Sorry, Dan, um, on Facebook asks... If I donate blood and then drink a lot of water, does it qualify as plasma dilution? And we've actually Great been question. asked that quite a lot. Yes, exactly. And uh, I received numerous emails about it. Can mm. I just donate blood, drink water? Um, and the answer is, it's an interesting idea, but this is not what we did or tested to be rejuvenated. So for rejuvenative effect, you need to lose about 70% of your blood right away to have an impact. And of course, then you cannot do it through donation or bloodletting. It will be neither healthy nor survival prone. So please do not do that. <laughs> uh, but there is a procedure which is FDA approved which is called therapeutic plasma exchange where your blood is removed to such a big degree within a matter of a couple of hours, but it is simultaneously replaced with physiologic fluid and your blood cells are given back to you. You are not losing blood. So it is a complex procedure that cannot be replaced by simply going to the bathroom and drinking lots of water or donating a little bit of blood. Please, and please do not try to do it at home. Yeah, don't, don't drink like gallons and gallons of water. I understand that that will actually kill you because um, it will... Um, affect well affect you uh i think it's the salt in your body it affects doesn't it but it can kill you so people have died from drinking too much water yes do not do it there is fda yeah. approved clinical procedure that your physician can evaluate and potentially prescribe it's actually a very interesting question hello irina and thank you very much for a very uh, good presentation um uh, as you know, uh, people are very curious about the ways how they can get this implemented as fast as possible. And I personally am very happy that there are approved procedures that remind the process of um, uh, plasma dilution that you are currently testing, uh, because it means basically that this therapy, once it's approved, once it's clinically proven and registered, can be actually easily transferred to other countries and implemented. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. And um, right now it is approved for particular diseases like autoimmune diseases and liver disease, right? Not for age associated diseases, but it has been already tried. There was a clinical trial on application to Alzheimer's disease, although they, they just focused on infusions of albumin rather than dilution of the age elevated plasma. But now with Dobre Kiprov, we are doing clinical studies which are becoming so popular that 
you know, we are run, running out almost of our capacity to accommodate all of the people who would like to enroll. And so those clinical studies do test whether FDA approved procedure could be applied to age-related disorders. And I don't see anything, you know, preventing it from spreading throughout the world and, you know, people's clinicians could perform this, pre uh, um, prescribe this procedure and there are numerous centers and hospitals that have capacity to perform it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And you know, one more interesting context for this is, as you know, uh, among the um, consequences of getting a, an infection with the coronavirus, uh, a lot of people are currently experiencing problems with the cognitive function. Uh, and uh, it looks like a global problem actually currently. So I'm thinking, I was thinking to ask you if uh, hypothetically, this procedure could actually help people uh, who suffered from the coronavirus infection to get back on track, basically. Do totally. you think that it might work? It might. And uh, Dobre Kiprov, with our small collaboration from Mike and me, wrote a specific opinion piece about applying therapeutic plasma exchange to treatment of coronavirus as well. It was published, I think, also a couple of months ago. So you guys might look it up. Awesome. Well, I was actually asking about the possibility of restoring cognitive function after uh, getting the coronavirus. Yeah, you know, it makes perfect sense because in any immune response or broad immune response or infectious disease, they will be elevated inflammatory secreted proteins in bloodstream and they will cross blood brain barrier and affect brain function. So dilution of those proteins kind of washing them away might help but you have to be very careful because you also are diluting circulating antibodies which are fighting the virus so without study or without you know biomedical approach i would not just say yes go for it yeah yeah absolutely thank you that's a very good uh, that's a very good point thank you Mm -hmm. Sorry, I joined in late. Um, my apologies on behalf of myself and the technical problems. Um, but uh, I did read the paper and I was very fascinated and intrigued by the entire entirety of it. And I had I got a ton of questions, but I just want to kind of focus on maybe one uh, one question that's popped into my mind is I know you, you know, in the paper, you're doing a sort of a combination approach with one of the Senolytics, Navidoclax. And I'm just wondering, um, are you anticipating doing any more combinations of of other um, of other therapeutics that are hitting other hallmarks of aging um, perhaps other sun analytics maybe you know maybe plant compounds or or you know um, nicotinamide mononucleotide or anything anything else um, in combination with uh, with the um, uh, neutral blood exchange I think you are, this is actually a perfect segue to what I think I forgot to mention. And, uh, and that is, we do not use combination approach. So we test analytic by itself. Uh -huh. And then we compare it in parallel with dilution of old plasma. Right? Mm -hmm. And we see what is better. And in our opinion, analytic by itself does not really do very much for the brain mm -hmm. at all. Where the neutral blood exchange does, even though they both act at the periphery. And what is very, very important is that if we believe that we uncovered the fundamental reason for aging, then our approach should be fundamentally rejuvenating. It should not improve the situation by 5% or 10% or increase the lifespan by a couple of percent. It should simply reverse the parameters that we test from old-like to young-like. And that is very importantly what we see. So mm -hmm. neutral blood exchange in the absence of anything else makes muscle repair just like a young muscle repair and reduces fibrosis in the muscle and the liver and reduces adiposity, improves neurogenesis, reduces neuroinflammation and improves performance of old mice to the level that now they are statistically the same as young. And so that is quite important, right? Because if you are testing an antibiotic, for example, you are not looking whether mice treated with antibiotic live a little bit longer than the mice are not treated. You are looking for reversal of a uh, disease, bacterial disease. So because of that, uh, now this is long-winded answer. 
we do not think that they, there is a need of synergy with mm -hmm. anything else because what synergy are you looking at or for? You already made all the animal practically young after one procedure. However, there is a much need to understand how long the effects last, what are their magnitude, do they always revert to the aging levels after some time, or do you become incrementally younger after this procedure? What is the molecular mechanism of those effects? What are the key cellular mechanisms? So there are a lot, a lot of study to improve the therapy, but I don't think there will be need for synergy with infants. Right. I mean, I'll go out there and say that that is a rather bold claim. It's a very exciting claim that, that you just made because, I mean, that, that claim basically just, you know, says that if we do do it properly, what you're suggesting right now, we should take, in, the, in theory, a 70-year-old man and convert them into a 20-year-old man, right? With, not right with, away, no. Yeah, not right away, can, but, no, but... No, 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 no. You can convert the tissue repair and regeneration to uh -huh. those of 20-year-olds. But you imagine how many pounds of tissue that is now old and you accumulated and there are numerous cells which are still there, right? They are mm -hmm. not being replaced by new ones. Right. So as the whole process, we cannot say that. But as one particular aspect, can we change regenerative capacity to that of a 20-year-old person? Yeah, we studied that for 20 years and I think that is the answer. That regenerative capacity decline is driven by age elevated proteome. And all of the young proteins are suppressed at genetic and epigenetic levels, but come back and are present again naturally and physiologically once the age elevated proteins are normalized. So that's what we stand for behind, right? And there are many, many, many steps. We will not going to make 20 year old person. Uh, sorry, 70 year old, 20 year old after one procedure, but we will attenuate the progressional aging for sure. How fast that person age is going for. And perhaps after we know more, we will start gradually reversing the entire aged state of the organism. And one more question. When you, it, when, uh, when you're thinking about designing or planning clinical trials, um, what are some of the one are, I mean, because there's there's a million kind of endpoints that you can you can gauge. I mean, are some of these endpoints, um, you know, obviously obviously if you if you have any kind of rejuvenation taking place, then obviously the, the per, an individual's capacity, um, you know, to have an improved immune system and fight off infections, you know, improves uh, various other morbidities decrease. Are you are you picking certain morbidities that you're looking at as endpoints? Do you have some in mind when you're going to be designing? Yeah more cl clinical trials in this direction? So Dobre is conducting successful clinical trial and he's running it as a business. Yeah. Because uh, the RFP that he has approved uh, allows to collect a uh, fee for service. And there are numerous people over expanding number of people who are performing it. So he is doing a um, series of therapeutic plasma exchanges over six months. So they have several of those and then follow up studies. And he has a great clinical trial protocol with all of the outcomes that you mentioned. So he measures clinical parameters. And in the Congo laboratory, we have parallel study on all of the scientific parameters, all of the so-called clock and various other molecular changes that we call hallmarks of aging. DNA repair, autophagy, mitochondrial activity, all of the you know, number of them. So, um, so those are progressing and we hope to publish some results quite soon in a couple of months. Well, submit them for publication in a couple of months uh, since they are quite promising. Yeah, quite promising. I cannot tell you all of the details obviously outside of you know, the common words that are in the published literature since it, since it is uh, developed by Professor Dr. Kipro. So Very when good. I um, hear about neutral blood exchange, but one of the big questions I wonder about is mechanism. Uh, if it the, the fairly dramatic effects, how did, how did it, how does it work? So in your in your table one, you list a lot of protein candidates uh, for things that have changed that have changed abundances after these procedures. Uh, but I'm wondering what your opinion is on um, uh, hormones like prostaglandins 
And I bring that up because there is this paper a few days ago published by the Andreasen lab where they were um, looking at cognitive decline in mice. And they had this um, intervention where they made myeloid cells that were insensitive to a particular prostaglandin, um, I think it was E2 via um, a Crelox system. And they saw effects that remind me of what you're describing in this paper. In particular, they saw a reduction in CD68 cells. And so in that paper, they say, okay, we're gonna take cells, we're gonna make them less sensitive to this thing found in blood. And in your case, you might be saying, you might have be a different way of getting at the same thing where what if you just have less of that in the blood in the first place? Um, so I don't, it, does that seem plausible to you that like that substances such as prostaglandins might be at play here? Um, so what seems uh, clear to me is that, and I would like to repeat it again, that there is no cell or protein or molecule encoded in our genome metabolically or directly that evolved to make us sick or old. And so all of the rejuvenative approaches will be focused not on successful ones, there will be numerous approaches, but successful ones will not be focusing on genetic inactivation or pharmacological removal of something, but rather on calibration to the normal young healthy levels. And then the second point is that there will be no silver bullet there will be not a single molecule that by itself will make you younger if you just change it. There are numerous you know, evidence in that regard, but the key one is that we would have evolved out of aging if it was only one thing. There would be immortal organisms or organisms that live hundreds of years if you could simply change the levels of the one thing and then become okay. And so, and that is just one, you know, there are numerous evidence to say that it is not one thing. So now the question is, how can you normalize everything to younger levels, hundreds of them, and not perturb them? Because if you perturb them somehow, then it will be not healthy or, or useful, it will be deleterious. So it's vice versa, right? You can try to control what cells do by going to the nucleus and ablating things, and it is not clinically feasible at all and never will be. Or you can try to figure out, is there a one general process? Why there is differences in prostaglandin, also differences in SARS, also differences in many other things. And so what we discovered after 20 years of research, starting from parabiosis, suturing mice together and observing that there is a robust improvement in pretty much every tissue. Why? You did not do anything, you know, cute biologically, you just featured young mice and old mice. So after a while, you know, going from multiple papers, the outcome is that aging is driven by elevation of certain proteins, numerous of them in your bloodstream. And therefore rejuvenation will be driven by normalizing those. And Thank among you. those, there will be, you know, prostaglandin, there will be cells, there are things that are secreted by damaged cells, things that are secreted by cells infected with retroviruses. There will be numerous, numerous things. We can figure out their hierarchy and then optimize the approach to make it pharmacological. And it will happen, but it will not be one silver bullet and it will take 10 years or so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mind you, 10 years or so, that's not really that long, long away, is it, when you think about it? So uh, I'm excited myself. We've got loads of questions uh, coming in from Facebook as well. Uh, but first, uh, Sven, Sven is in here, has asked a question. Could the decrease in beta gal be due to a, de uh, a decrease in activated... Uh, Macroglia. I think activated macrophages often stain SA beta gal positive despite not being senescent. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, so you guys remember that we had a senolytic, right? Official senolytic, which does not act on activated microglia, ABT 263, which specifically ablates senescent cells. 
And the effects of that analytic was that there was less SA beta gal positive senescent cells in the brain. So you can argue that senolytic does not really work as senolytic and does something for microglia, but it is unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, the second point is that, yeah, we show that we reduce neuroinflammation and specifically we reduce the numbers of activated microglia. So effects of the dilution of peripheral old plasma could be very well due to the diminished microglia activation. But I would argue against the point that macrophages that stain for SA beta gal are not senescent cells. How do you then define senescent cells? They are not dividing cells, they are permanently exited cell cycle and will not divide in response to growth factors. They have high levels of P16 and they are SA beta gal positive. So unless we redefine our um, senescent cell terminology, macrophages are de facto senescent cells. Something well, I'm not an expert in the area, but I came across uh, it a while ago and I thought, if I recall correctly, that you did have like macrophages that temporarily uh, could become SA beta hal positive and then revert back to non SA beta hal positive. Um, that is true for most of the cells. For example, fibroblasts, and that was presented at one of the senescent cell conferences where I was invited to, I think it was in Montreal. And um, Judy Campis was there. By the way, Judy and us are very good friends and collaborators, and we explore avenues for mutual work and collaborative studies. Uh, so, um, so fibroblasts, if they are overgrown in culture, will be SA beta gal positive. And if you split them, they also become SA beta gal negative. So SA beta gal permanence as senescent cell marker really is also questioned. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very interesting point is that even though senescent cell idea is a great idea and there's a lot of experimental evidence for its significance, a lot. And I really think that it is one of those profound skeleton keys to understanding aging and rejuvenation. Yet, as scientific community, we are still discussing almost at every meeting, what are senescent cells? Do they have any sort of definition or markers that will distinguish them from any other cell? So that is still conundrum, right? We are still discussing it. We don't know what the answer is. Thank you very much for clarifying. Mm -hmm. And I've got a question. This is from myself. Uh, you tested ABT263, which I believe is, uh, is not the BCLW pathway. Um, do you have any plans to check other senolytics that target other pro-survival pathways that they use? You know, like, I think some cells use P53 and... Yeah, well, we're not going to compete with Unity or Judy Campis in that, right? So I'm sure, and again, what I want to mention is that we believe in this uh, fundamental paradigm of aging and rejuvenation, but other research groups believe in other fundamental paradigms. And I think it is to the advantage of everybody, scientific community and ordinary people who are not just dorks, you know, scientific dorks and nerds like us. It's the advantage of everybody that we all explore our separate avenues. So I'm pretty sure that Judy Campisi Lab at Buck Research Institute and Unity will look at various analytics. Yeah, Judy uh, is very diligent. And of course she's building that, um, along with many other people, that senescent cell atlas, which is an impressive piece of work because we're finding out now that there's all kinds of different senescent cells. So it's, as you said uh, just now, it's what is a senescent cell? It's um, it's not entirely clear, and I don't think you know there's a, a proper definition quite yet. So yeah, but yeah, I, lo uh, I love Judy, and I think she's great. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, last year, and she was uh, she was super fun and really informative. So I always uh, I always look forward to seeing more from her, and it's great that you're working with Judy. So we have, oh, Victor, Victor's in here as well. Oh, he was, oh no, he's disappeared. But he asked, 
Uh, what about SAP, SAS, sorry, SAP, SASP modulators that do not kill senescent cells? He calls it seni, senostatics. I would call it, uh, I've heard the phrase senomorphic uh, used by uh, James Kirkland, uh, things that modify the SASP, so that they suppress it or they, they change it, but they don't get rid of the senescent cells. Any thoughts on what Victor uh, asked? So the same thing. I think you guys need to ask Judy Campisi and um, other people, Van Dursen Group, and um, people who actually focus on senolytics and cinematics and all of that things. From my perspective, all of these secreted proteins will be naturally modulated and normalized by a procedure of neutral blood exchange. And if there are reversible senescent cells in our bodies, they will become less senescent. This is my take on. And in our, you know, support of this broad kind of claim, very, very few procedures produce simultaneous rejuvenation of multiple tissues for all tested parameters and sort of vastly and quickly as our procedure, the procedure that we applied experimentally in mice and testing a var variation of that procedure in people. So many people claim one thing or another thing, but not all of them together so quickly and so robustly. And uh, before I, uh, I have to go soon, by the way, but um, there, were, there were questions about albumin, if ectopic albumin is important, and those questions appear from time to time also, right? Um, and so I would like to answer kind of broadly to that question is that we do not add albumin ectopically. We replenish albumin that otherwise is thrown out with the old plasma. And that is also why you cannot simply drink a lot of water, right, and have other unhealthy habits for rejuvenation. So once old plasma is removed, albumin is automatically also removed, 70% of it. So if you simply added saline, then there would be albumin insufficiency. So therefore we simply replenish 5% back. The albumin that we use is FPLC purified protein. So it doesn't have any young factors. And it is a powder which during the process of purification, you know, it is a harsh chemical process. And so anything else which could be associated with albumin is now degraded, denatured and killed. And uh, so albumin does not account for the rejuvenative effects. So you think about it, it would be a little bit strange that if you simply exchange old mice with young blood, you have just a little bit of a positive effect. But if you now do neutral blood exchange, you have huge positive effect. And it comes from this at room temperature stored albumin where everything else was denatured or killed by chemical purification. So that's an important thing. Remove, right, sorry. And there's the mic convoy, just doing something in the background. Yeah, removed by chemical purification, not denatured or killed. Mm -hmm. And you, and you, I no doubt you mentioned this in your materials and methods, but maybe just to re re reiterate, um, what, what's the source of the albumin that you use for the uh, replenishment? Yeah, it is a commercial FPLC purified albumin. So you buy it from, I think, Sigma, and it has like a link if you want to look it up. And this is this is recombinant mouse, recombinant human, recombinant. It's no, it is purified, right? So it is purified, yeah. right? Yeah, blood purified. They do a they do a cold and a and a, and a soft fraction. It precipitates the albumin. Um, I, I don't quite recall it being an FPLC step, but uh, no, step. But it's like you know ninety ninety five or better. And is this is this is this is this from mice? Is this from uh, cows? Is this from from, from mice? Yeah. So they, mice. Uh, okay. they, they they get bulk bulk okay. donor donor mice. So uh, the same thing they do with people. They get bulk donor people. Gotcha. And they okay. purify. Uh, you know, you get a you get a protein precipitate, and they can uh -huh. resuspend that into in whatever you want. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in our case, we resuspended it in saline. Um, uh -huh. In hindsight, I'd probably resuspend it in something a little more physiological than saline, like a, you know something with some other ions in it. But um, uh, and I don't know exactly what's in the, the human version, but there's a 
um, a common medical preparation, 5% human element that people use for the open space. Oh yeah, the dobre thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, that that's that. Yeah, thanks. And then you know, doctors will let their own cocktail for that. So. Yeah, yeah. For what dobre thing, dobre is using for his procedure is uh, his own, and it is the commercial thing that that doctors prescribe. So here's one that we get quite often, Irina. You're probably tired of hearing it, but. <laughs> people always uh, are always asking about lifespan studies and I know that you guys are not into that um, for a number of perfectly reasonable uh, reason reasonable reasons terrible mm -hmm. English but <laughs> and Neil is asking are there any plans to do a lifespan study perhaps with NBE being administered every three to six months yes it is well designed already and some of that is in progress it is a modified lifespan study, which is quite more, more interesting to me. Um, and I guess, yeah, um, we are looking for funding to support that study, as well as for funding to extend our clinical study in people. But our main thing um, is that we are not looking to start with young animals and start performing neutral blood exchange, which is of course less invasive, than injections with somebody else's bodily fluids and less invasive than parabiosis, but still it is an invasive procedure, right? There is no need to do it in young animals, but what we look at to test if you can start with animals that are older and the people who are older and make them significantly younger and for how long. So that is our take on life, not life, health extension study. So for everybody who's involved, I think they will not be interested in what if I do this procedure when they're 20 years old. They are more interested what if I do it when I'm 45, 50, 60, 75, or even 90. Can I become significantly younger for a long period of time? So 10 years from now, instead of being dead, and instead of being 90 years old, I'm pretty much like 60 or 65 or better. Yeah, and you wouldn't have thought that if you did it when you were like 20 or 25, which seems to be the sort of, you know, your prime, your optimal sort of age, you wouldn't think it would do much anyway, because there'd be nothing in the blood to calibrate, really. Yeah, exactly. It... You are optimally yeah. calibrated already. So the well, lifespan study, as long as we get a, an audience of millions on Facebook, um, maybe someone <laughs> from another lab, the, the, there's a technical problem with uh, doing a lifespan study with mice with the neutral blood exchange. And that is, um, in order to get the blood in and out of the mouse, you got to put a tube in front of the blood vessels and their their blood vessels are tiny. And so the tubes uh, clog, right? So we can get one round of exchanges with mice. Um, if we were really good, we could get maybe two rounds of exchanges with mice. But to do this again and again and again for months and months and months to see how long they'll live would be difficult. Um, It'd be nice if uh, if some other lab, like a rat lab or a you know maybe some some larger animal, wants, wants a dog wants to pick this up and, and try this um, because it's it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of a lot of a lot of risk and downside to it, especially if you're dealing with a large animal. You can start using um, well vetted technology in order to, to to have this been around for decades, right? So. Um, yeah, so I I, I, uh, I I wouldn't. We have other other ways of, of uh, other other avenues to pursue for for health span and lifespan. Um, this this one technically would be better in a in a larger animal. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So that's great. So if you guys uh, uh, would like to collaborate with your vets, we can certainly develop um, collaborative larger animal health span rejuvenation study but no need to start with young ones and then give them something when they're young. Hmm. Might be worth talking to, um, up just off the top of my head, Matt Cablin, who does the, um, the, uh, the dog aging out of Seattle. I don't know if you, I don't know if you've, uh, you've met Matt or, or not. Hmm. This is a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity. Exactly. 
we started study in our lab and we are looking to expand to larger animal model. Uh, probably worth introducing you to Matt then, I think, Matt Cable and and, yeah, uh, and so those, uh, sorry, I, I'm reading here um, that about how can we join the human trials and a bunch of people are interested. So um, I, I, if you send the email to me, I will just forward it to Dobr, Dobr Kiprov. And uh, he's in charge of it. So he has the approved IRB, nationally approved clinical trial uh, plan. And then he will give you all of the details. So you can send me an email and I will just bulk forward it to Dobre, or even better, not to you know call my email account to send the email to Dr. Dobre Kipro. He um he is prominently featured everywhere on the web and he has a very interesting YouTube video about the procedure. So there you go. There's two ways that you can uh inquire about the human trials because i'm sure everybody's thinking about it i mean i don't know about everybody in here but you know would you know if they'd be willing to try it or not me personally yeah i think i would definitely give it a whirl yeah um, i mean then I'd, I'd i have another working. question sorry to keep interrupting um, <laughs> right. plasma exchange has been used for long which is true in the case of alzheimer's patients um i don't know but um didn't we know the impact on inflammation? Yeah, so the effects of plasma exchange on just global inflammation, of course, is known because it is very intuitive. So you are diluting circulating inflammatory molecules. And in case of Alzheimer's disease, you are diluting peripheral toxic A beta. You are simply removing it from blood and therefore more of it leaks to blood from the brain so basically you are removing the key pathogenic toxin, kind of similar to what you do with auto reactive antibody. So the plasma exchange was always perceived as removal of the kind of broad classes of toxin. However, what we uncovered is that it normalizes the key signaling molecules in blood, which are not conventional inflammatory molecules. Those are molecules proteins that control interactive cell signaling pathways in every cell in your body. And when H elevated, then they make, they perturbed homeostasis. So cells cannot talk to each other like they did when you were young and healthy. So it is not simple removal of toxins. It is a reboot or resetting of your entire organism to its younger signaling self. So that to answer um, Edward's question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Edward from uh, ELA, Edward uh, Devonio from uh, the ILA. Some of you may know him. So yeah, good question. Thank you, Edward. And following on from that, I'm going to ask the obvious question. Is the grounds for optimism to think that when you reset the, um, the blood, as it were, given all the feedback loops and such like built into our system, can we perhaps hope that this state may be persistent for quite a while rather than, you know, having to do it every day or, you know? Yeah, totally. So, and that's uh, actually our figure six in the paper that we published back in May, which uh, shows that because we are changing signaling environment broadly in the body, it's not just removal of bond toxin or autoreactive antibody, we are broadly resetting or rebooting cell-to-cell -cell interactions molecularly. Cells have an opportunity to then have positive feedbacks to maintain those healthier states. And they will not be permanent, but we are working on the ways to increase the duration of the positive effects and also of their magnitude. So absolutely. So you are rebooting something, the system that you are rebooting is old and decrepit, so to speak, but it has an opportunity to have positive reinforcement to your input and it will. And then once reinforcement fails, the system returns to the state which is still old, but perhaps slightly younger. And then the question is how to potentiate what you are doing. So yes, absolutely. There are numerous biomedical 
evidence for us to explore. Cool. It sounds like that eighties movie cocoon, guys. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm definitely uh, excited. So it looks like there's um, well, right, questions now. Anybody, anybody else in here got a question or? Well, I have a general question, but it's 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 more kind of a I guess it's a it's it's a half half statement half question given that given that this you know this is appearing to work at least from Irina the experiments you've done with mice um, spectacularly well you have very significant improvements in mice and given the fact that this is based on an FDA approved therapy uh, for other indications that's that's been used um, uh, for a long time now and that there's uh, extensive safety protocols in place and given that most people that are in their 60s and certainly 70s and 80s have a variety of other comorbidities, you know, that that can be targeted by this. What's stopping a clinical trial with enrolling a million, two million participants when we're almost guaranteed of having, um, you know, an, an increase in, um, well, a decrease in, in morbidities, uh, you know, based on everything that I've seen so far, you know, what's what's stopping, a, you know, well, just the massive um, clinical trial really, from taking um, place? I think it is just a matter of funding and, yeah. uh, and then support, clinical support. So we need the big sponsor, right? Um, Dr. Kiprov recently directed 300 or 400 participant clinical trial on using modified therapeutic plasma exchange as the modality to treat Alzheimer's disease. And yeah. the results are published and the results are almost statistically significantly better in some parameters than control group. Right? And definitely I think, in my opinion, better than alcohol trial on infusions based approach. None of them really though reached the statistical significance so far. So um, I think that the way to proceed would be through a normal, you know, phase three clinical trial, not with 2 million people, but perhaps 300 or 400. And uh, to delineate all of the hallmarks of aging that could be reversed and all of the clinical parameters that could be improved. And Dr. Kiprov would be a perfect perfect director of the trials and we could certainly provide the um, scientific support through UC. But we are looking for funding, for dedicated funding for such a trial. Um, particularly, we are looking for funding to expand the trial just from longitudinal analysis, you know, the same person before versus after, to also include placebo group, which right now we do not have because the trial is self-supported. People basically are paying for service. So they are all being treated and we just compare the outcomes before versus after round one, round two, round three and so forth and then the follow-ups. So having more people having placebo group will be critically important. And then I think we will be in a good shape to, um, to have FDA approval of the new application of FDA uh, approved therapy to plasma exchange. Right now it's approved for classes of diseases we need to show evidence that it would be beneficial for other diseases. Mm -hmm. Well, it would suck to be in the placebo group. That's all I'm going to say. So hopefully I, uh, I, if I was in it, I'd get lucky. So as okay, I say. Guys, so we have to wrap up because I really have um, a series of additional Zooms today on various <laughs> discussions. So I really appreciate everybody's interest and um, thank you so much. Thank you for the positive, for the good words that I read in chat. Yeah, that's great. And thanks very much uh, to Irina and Michael for joining us today and going through the paper. That was fantastic. We're all super excited. I think that's, that's, that's pretty fair to say. And we look forward to hearing more and seeing more results in, in the near future. Bye-bye. So, yeah, thanks. thanks for everyone who's joined us today, and we will see you next month with something else exciting. So uh, keep watching the uh, website, and we'll let you know what is coming up next. And thanks to our Lifespan Heroes. 
some of them have joined us today uh, on the call live and we very much appreciate their support in making this show possible and many other things and um, hopefully we'll see you guys next time and if if you're interested in supporting us do check out our heroes page at uh, lifespan forward slash heroes to learn more see you later guys and girls Thank you.